thank you so much for attending. I'm glad you could all join us on this nice, bright Tuesday, Valentine's Day morning. Uh, my name is Alessandra. I'm a licensed mortgage agent with Army Mortgages. And today we're going to talk about credit and how it impacts your life. And today I am joined by my colleague, Phil. So Phil, if you could introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, everybody. Very nice to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Phil Nunes. I work for a company called Merrick Slenwise. Uh, I represent uh, lenders here today, and hopefully I can answer any questions you might have around uh, credit and uh, how it affects you and your, your daily lives. Perfect. Okay, so before we start, other than Shannon, how many people are familiar with what a credit report is or have looked at their own credit report in the last few years? Okay. More than I expected, this is interesting. Most people have no idea that they can even order one. So basically, before we get into the real information, the stuff that everybody is dying to know, I just wanted to go over a few things of what today is and what today isn't. So one thing to make very clear, today is not a place to discuss any personal credit questions that you have. So today is just for generic information, just so that you get the education component that a lot of us feel that we don't we didn't get either from school or for our parents, the things that you need to know because it impacts your daily life. OK, so what is credit and why is it so important? So what credit is, is it's a way where, you know, it can be a credit card, a line of credit. It can be a car loan. It can be a student loan. All of these things get recorded somewhere. So if you have a credit card and you've used it responsibly, then we have a system in place, either you've looked it up through TransUnion or Equifax, and what it does is says, okay, this is the scoring system that we have in place to see how financially responsible that you are. Okay, and when it comes to lending specifically, so this will go for anything that you apply for, whether you're applying for a credit card, line of credit, what have you, there's these things that we call the five C's, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it's more for the lending side, but we look at things like capacity, collateral, conditions, character, and capital. So to summarize all those points together, what a lender looks at your credit for, so again, even if you're just applying for a credit card, they're gonna take into account things like, what is your income? What is your financial responsibility? And do they think that if you were to use this, to its fullest extent that you can carry those payments. Um, <clears throat> oh, I thought someone had a question. Um, so basically what your credit score and your credit report are is it gives us a snapshot of how you pay your bills because things like your phone bill also show up on there. So we get to see, you know, what's the history of this person? What are they like? What do they do responsibly? Are they making payments on time? Things like that. Um, and then essentially it, it assesses your credit worthiness. So lenders will look at that and say, okay, you know what? This person has good history. We like this. We're willing to give them money. We're willing to give them access to money for things like the line of credit. Any questions about that part before we move into the next part? No, uh, Phil, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? No, that was a perfect summary. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So. Credit scores themselves, there is a calculation for it. And the easiest way to summarize it, so 35% of your score is your payment history. Are you making payments on time? Are you making them late? Or are you not making them at all? So that is 35% of your score. 30% of your score is based on how much of your total credit that you owe. So if you have, say, a credit card for $5,000 and it has no balance on it, or it's just, you know, you filled up your gas tank and you've paid it off, that 30% is going to be really good. But if you have a $5,000 credit card and it's totally at the limit, that's going to bring your score down by that 30% because it's going to look at the, the system's going to calculate that and say, hold on a second, because now we've got a $5,000 credit card that is now at its limit. So if you have multiple cards and they're all at the limit, that's going to really bring it down. A 15% of your credit score is actually the length of time you've had a piece of credit for. So the best example is I have um, some clients that are in their 70s and they have fantastic credit scores because they've had the same credit card since they were about 20 years old and they never really use it. So the system looks at that and says, wow, this person has had this piece of credit for so long that they've barely used it, but it's been there and it's been used responsibly for all these years. So that helps to boost your score as well. 
10% uh, is actually new credit, which is a little bit of a, it's not looked at as much in some situations. So for example, if you get a new car loan, it's going to look like it's at the limit, but lenders do take things like that into consideration. So they'll say, oh yes, this person did buy a new car loan, but they've had it for a few months and they've been making good payments. Um, where you get into trouble is where you've got new credit, like a credit card, and it's already maxed out. That's where we get into, that's where we get into trouble. Um, and 10% is types of credit used. So again, there's different types of credit. So there's open, revolving, and uh, open, revolving, and your credit cards um, and installment loans. So it looks at different things like how many lines of credits do you have, how many credit cards, how many loans, things like that. So all of those pieces together is how your score is actually calculated. Um, any questions about those percentages? So if you only have one, let's say you only have a credit card, then um, can that one credit card uh, give you a perfect score? It can in some cases. So this is something that we do see pretty often. So sometimes we will see somebody who just has a credit card or who just has their cell phone bill reporting. So sometimes we get a bit of an artificial score because, and Phil can attest to this, what they're going to want to see is more types of credit because it gives a better snapshot at how you're using different credit vehicles. So if you have a student loan and it's been paid off, it'll still show up there, but it's not giving us any real information. It shows that you've paid it off, but it's not showing how you're going forward when you have all these new types of credit as well. So, they, and I'm sure Phil will speak to this in a moment too. Like there are times where we will see one type of credit, but it may not give us enough information to determine how credit worthy someone is. That is correct. And if it, Ali, if you could just allow me to add, so so this is a probability model, and it's built on an algorithm that's supposed to feed the system and give us a good idea on a client's credit profile. Like every model, like every algorithm that's out there, there are insufficiencies to it, right? Meaning that there are situations that fall outside the scope, outside the variance. And in those cases, we'll take a deeper look at, as to why. Uh, but really important, one thing that I want to just underline is notice how there's a high percentage of, 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 I guess, factors that you can control as a consumer uh, when, uh, uh, you know, taking care of your credit score or taking care of your credit quality, right? 35% payment history, that's huge. 30% amounts owns, that's huge. These are all things that are controllable factors that you as a consumer knowing about these can control the algorithm, control the, the output of your credit score that can then help you to get more credit and be able to invest into a property or buy a new rental, whatever it is that you're doing, okay? Perfect. Uh, Ali, and, what's that? Alex, I two questions. Um, sure. So in terms of the uh, the part that you mentioned about the amount O, um, how is your credit impacted uh, if you have a high amount O, but then you pay it at the end of the month? Um, do they look at that? And then second question is, uh, how's your credit score impacted if you uh, have the high amount O on one credit card versus spreading your debt over several credit cards? Which one's better? Okay, so what happens is your credit card company is only actually reporting to things like Equifax and TransUnion once a month. So it really depends on what day they've reported it and what day you made your payment. Now, those days do not usually match up. So in terms of, so for example, when you get a mortgage, we have the ability to say, oh, hey, this card here, it's actually been paid off and we can provide proof. Um, and this is something that Phil will attest to. We see all the time because things happen. You know, maybe you had to get your car repaired because car repairs are not cheap, right? So if you have a $3,000 credit card, for example, maybe that full amount had to be charged to the credit card because $3,000 is not easy to pay on a debit card in one day. So you can say to the you can say to the lender, oh, by the way, this card was paid off. They had car repairs and they'll say, OK, great, just give us proof. And they'll give a little bit of leeway if that score is a little bit lower because that one card is at the limit. In terms of having multiple balances on multiple cards, what happens is it depends on a number of factors. So depending on how much is on that one particular card, you kind of, when you reach that halfway point, so for example, a $5,000 credit card with a $1,000 balance, and then you have a few of those, 
it's not as big of an impact because you're using one fifth of that card and you've spread it out over so many cards. But when you have five credit cards and they're all half or more, that's really where your score is. You're going to see that big decline. Okay, so it's so what's worth one credit card at max five thousand or five credit cards at one thousand? Again, it's going to depend on your overall credit. So without being able to say for sure what the major impact is going to be, it still is going to take into account your overall report because there's going to be other things on your report that will also impact what's going to bring that score down or what's going to bring it up. But generally speaking, if you are able to keep your cards below that halfway point, it would be better. Because what the system does is it'll say, okay, so if you have, say, $10,000 available in credit, how much of that $10,000 has been used overall? Yeah, and, and that's just it, Tony. So so if 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 you have a $5,000 overall revolving limit, meaning that you have it, even if you haven't spread out through five cards, if you are using all five cards at max, it will affect you negatively. Uh, to your point, and I think what you're asking is, if you have one card with $5,000 and you have uh, four other cards with five thousand dollars. Is it wise to put the five thousand just one, in one card, or is it better to spread it out through your twenty-five thousand limit? Uh, I would say it's always better not to have a product reach its max, right? But again, lenders and in terms of the model, they're looking at the overall revolving credit. Uh, but to your point, there is a benefit, of course, of trying to spread that out and not having it just in one card. Uh, uh, you know, hitting that that max limit on that one product. Okay. Great. Thank you. That uh, that answers my question. Uh, to uh, so basically, better to diversify your credit cards. That is correct. Yes. Well, guys, these are great questions. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of questions. Okay. Now, um, so we talked about the scoring model. We talked about how that works. So there are many different things that can impact what your credit score is. So the first example would be things like a credit check. So there are two types of credit checks. There's a hard check and a soft check, and they are not quite the same thing. So a soft check would be, for example, when you get your free report for the year. That is not something that should impact your score. But if you're applying for a credit card, if you're applying for a line of credit, or any type of loan, the lender will do what's called a hard check because it gives them a lot more detail. And each, depending on what it is they're pulling that for, it will it might give them a different report. So the report that you receive as a consumer will be different than the report I get as a mortgage professional. Um, and then we have sort of the big three things that impact. Sorry, credit. Alexander. I, yeah. So I do have a question. Why is it different? I because we we've had like I've had it where I pulled it like within 30 days of someone else pulling it um, mm -hmm. and they do get a different number. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> what's the difference? So it depends on a few things. So first, if it was a hard check, then your score is going to come down by about 10 points. Okay. And if it's for a mortgage, for example, it'll be the information that is on the report will be a little bit different. So we get things like bankruptcy indicators that you that you wouldn't necessarily get on your personal report because your personal report is you taking steps to make sure that there's no fraud or make sure that there's no mistakes, right? So you may not see all of the other indicators that we receive because, again, this is determining credit worthiness for hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So there's going to be more information that we need to see about people than necessarily if you're applying for a credit card or a student loan or something. Okay, cool. And I had it actually, I actually had it happen a different way when I got my personal um, check. My number was lower than what the mortgage person had pulled and brought back to me, which was nice. I was very happy <laughs> that they got a higher number, but I was like, hmm, that's interesting how you got that different information, but very cool. Yeah, so it could have been a few things. So it could have been, again, so your credit card companies and everything else, they only report at certain times, right? So it could have been, if it was so many days later, it could have reported that a card that was maybe had a balance on it was paid off. Right. So there's a few different things that can happen. And there's there's reasons why there's discrepancies. And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we get the lower number and we have to try and figure out why. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Phil? 
No, I, I mean, it's it, in 30 days, a lot of things do happen though, right? So so 30 days uh, doesn't seem like a, a long time, but it really is. And all you need is one of these factors or variables to be changed on the report for your credit score to change very quickly. The algorithm is in constant movement, right? And and all you need is one of the variables to change for the equation to change and the score model to come down or up, right? So 30 days is a long time. It, it, it doesn't seem like it, but it can be in terms of the factors that affect the credit score overall. Yeah, no, it's true. 30 days is a very long time. <laughs> In the credit world, it is. <laughs> Even just 15 days, sometimes you're like, what happened? What happened? Um, perfect. So the three big major credit events that you can have are things like bankruptcies, consumer proposals, and credit counseling. So to briefly cover each one, a bankruptcy is when you go through a trustee and you declare bankruptcy. And there are many reasons that people declare bankruptcy. Um, and you have credit counseling, which is where a third party helps you with your with your debt load and they help you manage it. Same with the consumer proposal. These are all debt management solutions that are available to you. Um, and, and just a quick note on those. Don't don't ever be ashamed if that's something that you have to do. There are many, many reasons why people have had to go through those. But the important thing to know is that if that is something you have had to go through, you do need to work on rebuilding credit because those things will stay on your credit report for years. And these are things that will impact you whether or not you're looking to work on your mortgage. So Phil will attest to this. Lenders will still check your credit when it when you come up for renewal. So if you have one of these things on there, you do need to work on um, rebuilding your credit. Absolutely. It, it's it's it, you know, a, a bankruptcy does not nullify you from ever getting credit again, uh, but it definitely makes it a lot harder. And and so does, and so do consumer proposals. Uh, most lenders will put um, rules in the place so that you can only ask for credit after X amount of years of discharging. And that varies from from lender to lender. I won't speak to what Merrick's does, but but uh, overall, there are different rules. But pretty much every lender out there will have limits on what you can do if you've had a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal. So, yeah. sorry. So I know that like for financials, it's probably a bad thing to kind of go through something like a bankruptcy. Um, now I've heard kind of the other side where someone did go through a bankruptcy and within a year they were super excited looking to get a house and all that stuff and I didn't think that was possible within that 12 month period or like I think it was like 12 or two years or something but now he was like yeah no my credit's great I'm all <laughs> good to start looking for a house and I was like okay so why is it such a bad thing yeah, no, I, I, I look, I don't know the particular case of the person obviously you're, you're speaking mm -hmm. about, but I would say this very unlikely, very unlikely that uh, after one year of, of discharge, not even bankruptcy of discharge, that that person would be eligible to get credit with most lenders. Uh, okay. You know, lenders will have different packages, different programs, different products. Uh, we all base our models, our risk models on probability. And the, uh, unfortunately, you know, one year is usually not enough. Uh, uh, for for lenders to say, okay, we're good with this. Let's go ahead and and, and finance this person, right? So so highly unlikely that would happen. Uh, but again, yeah. look, uh, some lenders will have different products, different programs at times. Uh, as a general rule, uh, normally from a bankruptcy, most lenders would want to see two years from discharge and credit recovered. Yeah, so that's why I thought it was more like two to five or something. But um, the way he was talking about it, I was like, okay, that sounds like everyone should get one if you got. Yeah, just get rid of it a year later you're good right but um so for kind of clearing so the other kind of caveat to that is th there's a lender for every situation okay. but what i don't know that he told you was if it was a more expensive mortgage because right. there are lenders who will look at it but the the closer you are to that discharge date the more expensive it probably becomes because there are lenders who will look at these things, but they charge fees and much higher interest rates. Because we have to remember the interest rate is also partly the risk to the lender, right? right. So when you see people with these higher interest rates, like anything that's above what the regular, like what the banks and lenders like Merrick's are offering, they're taking on that risk, but they're also saying, look, we'll do the risk, but it's going to cost you more money. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And we didn't get into the rate, so <laughs> it could have been high. Yeah, <laughs> you never know because people sometimes, especially when they've been through something like that, they don't necessarily want to disclose what their rate is and they're just very happy that they could get something. 
Right, exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah, so there's still there's still a lot behind the scenes that somebody may or may not want to talk about. That's something that we see all the time. So, okay. So um, we kind of touched on this before, uh, being closer to or at or above your limit will also really bring your score down. So there are times where, depending on that reporting date, sometimes people are over their limit a little bit because they didn't remember that they have an automatic bill payment that comes through. And sometimes the credit company will allow things to go over a little bit because they know that a payment's just been made. There's a lot of different situations that that can apply for, uh, but being over your limits is not good. You do not want that to happen. So you wanna do your best to keep them at or below if you really get into trouble. And like we talked about before, if you're able to spread them out over multiple cards and keep those limits as low as possible on each one, that is better for your score. Another really big one is missed or late payments. This is very important, especially when you're applying for anything, because it's less likely that lenders and institutions are going to give you money if you're not good at making your payments. That is very important and a big piece of credit worthiness, because if you're not making your payments on time, the system will track how late those payments are. So if it's a few days after, that your payment was due, sometimes your institution, whoever you have your credit card with, for example, they may not always label it as being late, but if you're paying it two, three months later, or even a month later, they're gonna go, come on, you know when your bill is due, we sent you the, we sent you the statement, you need to pay us. So payments are a very, very important thing. Please make your payments on time. And this goes for cell phone bills as well. Your cell phone company reports to your credit report, they do keep track if you're paying them late. So for example, I had one gentleman who kept forgetting to pay his bill and it was always two to three months late. And it's like, why? You know, your bill is due every month. And he goes, no, I just kept forgetting about it. And I said, well, it's impacting you. You still need to make that payment on time. Um, another, another really big one that we do see is how close are you to the limit after getting that credit card? Because if you get new credit cards and you're already putting them at the limits, that is something that lenders look at and say, okay, hang on. Because this is something that Phil will probably see a lot as well, where they, we go, okay, well, they have this card, it's $5,000, they got it two months ago, and now it's at $5,000. That is something that gets looked at a lot too. Yeah, that is correct. It's consumer behavior, right? So so if we're, if we're trying to calculate how this customer is going to pay for our mortgage, uh, for their mortgage uh, within their income level, how do we factor those other credit products into it? And how quickly do they accumulate debt from their consumer habits, right? And those consumer habits can really hurt the overall perspective we have on an application. Yeah, yeah. so what this also applies to is oftentimes when you have a credit card or a line of credit, the, your institution will say, hey, you've been really good with this. We're going to increase your limit. So where you don't want to get into trouble. So while it's good to accept those higher limits because it can help your score, depending on what's happening, you want to do a bit of an insight check on yourself and you don't necessarily want to accept that if you're just going to use it. So you need to be very smart with those credit increases because if you're just going to use it, you're not going to help your score. And you need to really take a look at, okay, what is it that I need to change about this? Because if you're just going to get those credit increases and take that money back out or utilize it, then you're just going to be right back in the same boat that you started in. But if you say to yourself, okay, I know I have this debt and I'm going to work on paying this down. I'm going to accept the credit increase, but I'm actively going to pay it down. That will help you out. So just be careful with those credit increases. And again, check your insight on yourself. Make sure you understand why you're accepting it and know that if you use it, it is not going to be helpful. Um, and then two things that are usually a fun surprise for people on their credit reports are judgments and collections. So you may not necessarily remember that you forgot to pay some sort of bill. You may not remember something that you've done. It, it happens from time to time because we move a lot. So you may not be getting all your notices from somewhere that you used to live. But believe me, credit companies will find you. 
they will find you and they will report it on your credit if it is something that you have not paid. And uh, Phil, I'm sure you see them all the time too. And we get an application and we go, okay, this person has a collection. What's happening with it? Right. Um, and they will report if you have paid it in most cases, sometimes mistakes do get made. But again, lenders and other, and other institutions will say, okay, can you just prove to us that it's been paid? Because maybe that credit collection company just didn't report it as being paid. Um, but judgments as well. So if you've ever been taken to court, so let's say you have a small claims court judgment against you for $10,000, that also usually gets reported. So if you have any sort of judgment or collection against you, you do want to deal with that because it will impact your credit. So best thing you can do in that case is if you're not sure and you get your personal credit report and it shows up on there, it will tell you who the collection company is. Sometimes the reference number that is on there is their internal reference number, and it might be a little bit different from some of the um, documentation that they've sent you, but you can generally search them online and find their office and give them a call and work on getting that done. Uh, any questions? Um, yeah. About so, those? Um, sorry. So it's, uh, it's um, interesting because I've seen on like TikTok and Reels and stuff, which I know most of it's all fake and whatever else but I just thought it was interesting this guy did say um once it hits your like once your kids goes into collections then they don't actually own it you don't have to pay it which for me I would think would be quite crazy because it's going to affect your score and stuff right but he's like no don't pay it just let it fall off seven years later and I'm like well you want it to be on there for seven years like I don't really understand that logic <laughs> but he was saying it as if well you know, it's already on there, it's already affected it, so just leave it, you know, and it'll fall off seven years, and then you don't have to pay for it. Um, obviously, that's not the best way to get better credit, <laughs> but <laughs> what, what would you say about that? Like, is that just complete craziness? Do you want someone to leave? Yeah, for someone to leave it. Yeah, I, I, so, so, <laughs> So I would, uh, first thing I would say, I would refrain from getting financial advice from TikTok. <laughs> yes, obviously. But, yeah. but uh, no, and I say that as a joke, of course, but it, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of people out there placing themselves as gurus that try to manipulate the the algorithm behind this and then try to give advice based on that. It's difficult to, 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 to say that there's any benefit from that type of advice. I will say this from a lender perspective, and that's really what I can speak about, is a collection on file uh, will stop us from funding a mortgage, will stop us from giving a client an approval. Um, if the collection has not been resolved and if there's not a proper justification for it, it will stop us from giving an approval. Uh, we don't care if it's been seven years, six years, five years, if it's on there and it's showing, um, it, it, it's going to be a problem. The other thing I would say is that some of these collections companies are very difficult to deal with. They're very difficult to address. They're very difficult to get information from, and they're very difficult to get them to actually move to solve your problem, right? And so what I would say for anybody is that if you're trying to get a mortgage or you're trying to get a credit product, whatever it is, uh, deal with these things quickly because unfortunately, uh, if you're waiting for to get too close to your closing, you run the risk of not being able to solve this on time. Right, absolutely. It, so it is, it is serious stuff. It really is serious stuff and it can hurt you overall uh, from getting more credit or getting credit at all. Yeah, like, and th it's funny that people are out there saying that because I just think that's, you know, such the opposite of <laughs> way you should be it, telling it's people. It's irresponsible, really. Yeah, really. yeah. Because I have heard someone who had like 700 credit and they did have one thing on their credit um, against their credit because whatever, for whatever reason, it wasn't even a big thing. I think it was under $500 and whoever they were trying to get information or money from said, no, you have to clear that up before we'll give you anything. And it wasn't, <laughs> it, it was just a complete stop for them. And, and even Paul's good credit. Well it is. And policy will depend from lender to lender, of course. Uh, different lenders will have different policies. Different risk takers will have different policies, to Ali's point previously. However, mm -hmm. uh, I can speak for, for kind of the AAA side of things. I can tell you that a collection on file needs to be resolved before doing anything. Uh, of course, there are lenders out there that will be a little bit more lenient with the price increase, right? Coverage of risk. Yeah. Um, 
but but again, like if 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 anyone has a collection, uh, they should, if anything, try to resolve it anyway. You know, maybe it's not their debt. I mean, I've seen mistakes be made where mm-hmm. a collection is showing on somebody's bureau that actually wasn't their debt, right? And so, right. Uh, the only way to fix that is to address it, right? Absolutely. So now, what would you say if someone's looking to get a mortgage or a loan or whatever? How far in advance do you need to have that cleared off? Like you guys say, 15, 30 days is a long time, but you're going to go back probably three, four months just to see right. what the history looks like, right? Different from lender to lender, different from policy to policy. In our case, and and I think the majority of triple lenders is if there's proof that the collection has been paid, even if it's still showing on the on the report, we will accept that as as mitigation, right? Okay. So when yeah. you're done paying it, then you just ask for that letter or whatever that they send you. Cool. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that's something that is unfortunately pretty common because again, the credit reporting companies, TransUnion and Equifax, they're not making those changes right away because they're updating the credit reports only so often. Mm-hmm. So it takes them time because there's a bunch of processes that have to happen in the background. So not only does someone from Equifax or TransUnion have to update that, but they have to first get the information from that company. So depending on when that company gives you the letter saying the collection is paid, it takes time for them to then say, okay, we've got a stack of files that we have to give updates for TransUnion and Equifax for. And then it takes time to go through all those people, unfortunately. Right. So you shouldn't pay pay it off and then say, okay, now I'm ready. (laughs) If you have the letter, we can work with that, right? Okay. Okay. So it depends on what documentation that you have in place. Like if a payment's been made and they didn't give you a receipt, they didn't give you a letter, that's not a good sign. Because then we have no proof to show that payment has been made. And that's really what it comes down to. What is the proof? What can we provide to show that it has, in fact, been completed? Awesome. But And and here's what I'm going to say. Seven years, like if 30 days is a long time, seven years is like a lifetime. Yeah, like who has time to wait seven years? (laughs) It's definitely not a good financial year. (laughs) Yeah, because we think of every one year. No. No, but like Phil said, it's hard because we're, we're really easy to click on things that are clickbaity. It's really easy to click on things that have a fun title, right? And then you end up watching the whole video because you're like, well, now I have to see this to the end. I have to see how this ends. But it's also just media literacy, right? And critical thinking. Okay, so yeah, so judgments, collections, you're going to want to deal with those. And the other reason that you really want to deal with them, especially if you're buying a home, what we don't want to see is anyone put a lien on the property. We do not want to see anyone else who has any sort of interest in the property itself. So if somebody puts a lien on the house, if you go, if you come up for refinance and you're trying to take equity out, that has to be dealt with because we can't, because what happens is you have different positions to title of home. So you have the homeowners and they own the home, but then you have the mortgage company who says, okay, this is our interest in the property because we gave you X amount of dollars to help you buy this home. And then when you come up for renewal, what's going to happen is there's going to be something registered on title saying, oh, well, we actually owe person A from this judgment $10,000. So now we have to give them $10,000 because now we have to sort out what we're going to do with them. And it, and it happens. There are times where people don't know they have a lien on the house because they just throw out the paperwork. They see that it's coming from whatever law firm and they go, well, that has nothing to do with me and just throw it out. And next thing you know, this $10,000 is collecting interest for five years. So it's not something that it's not going to go away easily. And then we get a call from the lawyer's office saying, oh, by the way, there's a lien on title. We have to deal with it now. Yeah, okay. I think I've heard a lot of uh, liens happening when you do a um, construction within the company or in the house, and then the company can technically lien your house if you haven't paid it. Yeah, construction loans are a little bit different. Probably the most common lien you will find on the house is actually your water heater or furnace. Oh, really? Those are probably the most common one because I find a lot of people don't understand those contracts and they don't realize that it's secured against the property. But those ones are are typically very easy to deal with. So if we're replacing a mortgage with another mortgage, they'll say, yeah, that's fine. Bump us down. Because what happens is you have like first interest, which is usually the mortgage, and then reliance, for example. So when we remove that mortgage and put a new one on, it technically drops to number two and reliance moves up. But reliance Mm -hmm. is usually very good at saying, no, no, put us back to number two. We're fine. We're fine. Right. 
Yeah, those are the most common liens that you'll see. Okay, um, perfect. So in terms of going more into like credit rebuilding and how important that is, it's very important if you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to go through bankruptcy or consumer proposal or anything like that, your discharge date is very important. And we kind of touched on this earlier when Phil said, you know, two years of credit rebuilding is very, very important because even though you've gone through something and there, and again, there are many reasons why people go through these. The most common one I see is, is a, a divorce or a separation. And one client was self-employed and the other one wasn't. And because of all the debt that was accumulated in the company and the other spouse had to sign on, there was a bankruptcy because they didn't have enough maybe in the equity of the home when it sold to deal with all the debt. It's probably the most common one that I see anyhow. So again, your discharge date is important because we want to see two years of you being financially responsible. Um, we want to see that you've taken steps to rebuild your credit. So in so what is rebuilding credit? So the most common one that people turn to to rebuild their credit is actually Capital One. And you may have to get a secured MasterCard. You may have to get a secured something to start rebuilding your credit. Maybe you get two secured credit cards for $1,000 each. After two years, if you've used those cards responsibly and they're not over their limits, they're not constantly late payments, lenders will look at that and say, wow, this person's really working hard to rebuild their credit. And it's been after their discharge date, they've done really well. And you know what? We're interested. Uh, do you wanna add anything to that, Phil? No, it's, 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 uh, it, it, that's, that's just it. It's just really showing the, the, the banking system, the credit givers, I guess, uh, the, that, that, you know, that whatever happened was a blip and, and there was a justification for it and that you're able to, you know, as a consumer recover and, and be able to, you know, from there on be, be fully responsible for your future debts. Right. And, uh, there are, uh, I'll add to that. There are a few companies out there now that are managing credit profiles that way. Um, I won't say the name of the companies here for purpose of, of, of publicity, but there are companies out there that will take a, a an advice approach and will be able to help consumers that have gone through this to really rebuild that credit and position themselves and put themselves in the proper position to be able to ask for credit again, okay? And I'm so sorry. I'm going to ask another question. No, go ahead. Don't apologize. <laughs> I feel, feel like I'm harassing everyone with these questions, but um, Not at all. So, what, so if it's about the history then does it come down to mostly history or the actual number that the credit score is, or is it just a combination? It, it, definitely a combination. Uh, combination. The number, the number is the number could be important if it's lesser than what that lender specifically it wants to do with their beacon score, right? So if the credit okay. score is below a certain threshold, that could nullify the opportunity to do a deal. Uh, right. You definitely want to see it above that limit, but then it's really about the history and how the person is recovering. It takes time for that credit score to start really getting to a point where it's 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 acceptable. Um, but but most lenders will look at at both cases. They'll want to see the behavior. They'll want to see the, the the actual credit score cross that line, the minimum line of of, of, of lending, uh, I guess, desire. Okay, so if you're under that line, it's pretty much a definite no, no matter how your history is. If you're above that, then they go, okay, let's check the history, and then they'll kind of look at it from there. Right, depending on the lender and depending on the risk they want to take, right? So, right. so gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and it's also important to remember, we touched on this earlier before, it also depends on, like, what does that all look like together? Because as we mentioned before, we might have a higher number, but it may be artificial. So if somebody post bankruptcy has their cell phone only as a reporting thing, cell phones, while they do contribute to their score, most lenders say, well, everybody has a cell phone, so we don't look at that or weigh it as heavily as we would a credit card or a line of credit. So if that credit card is being paid as agreed and it's and it's doing well, and they look at that and say, okay, well, this person has like a 750 score, but the only thing on there is a credit card, that's going to look get looked at very differently. Because again, with a with a cell phone, it's a contract. So you know how much you're paying every month. There's no opportunity for you to increase it and borrow back like you would a credit card or a line of credit. So right. they're like, okay, that's great. You're paying this cell phone contract as agreed. But also if you don't, they're going to take your service away. So we don't get to see as much financial responsibility there because again, there's no revolving portion to that like it would be a line of credit. So are you borrowing against it and paying it back, borrowing against it, paying it back? Right. Okay, cool. Thank you.
No, no problem. It's a great question. So now that we've kind of talked about what the major credit events are, it's important to know how long any, everything actually stays on your credit report for. So if you have an active account, so your credit card, line of credit, as long as you're paying your loans, they're going to stay on your report as long as they're open. So open accounts are ones that you're actively using. And closed accounts are ones that you've either closed. So if you have a new cell phone company, your old one will get closed and it will just sit there for about, I believe it's 10 years that things get taken off once they're closed. So if you have a student loan that you paid off five years ago, it's still on there. Even though you've paid it off five years ago, we still get to look at the history up to 10 years later and say, okay, we see that you had the student loan. However, it looks like in it looks like you had trouble paying it because every payment was showing a month late. So those things all get taken into account. When it comes to bankruptcy, uh, first and second bankruptcies have different timelines. So your first bankruptcy stays up to six years from your discharge date or seven years if there's no discharge date. A second bankruptcy and any other following bankruptcies are up to 14 years. And I've had some clients who have gone through three bankruptcies. So it's, it feels like it's never coming off at 14 years. Um, uh, judgments. So again, if you were sued and a judgment is rendered against you, that is six years. Uh, consumer proposals are three years after you've paid your balances or six years from the date that they're filed, whichever date comes first. Uh, payment histories, they keep your payment history on file for six years. So if you have a payment from 10 years ago that you missed, chances are it's not it's not being recorded on there. Um, and collections are six day, or six years from the date of your last payment. And if it's not paid, it usually just stays on there and hangs out for a while. Um, and any inquiries to your credit. So anyone who's checked your credit. So if you got a new cell phone last year, it'll show, for example, Bell Canada checked your credit this month. So depending on what that activity is and how long it stays on your credit for, again, remember credit history is part of that calculation. So for the bankruptcy, for example, if it's going to be on there, it's, 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 it's there for at least six years, depending on where you fall on that. And it's, and it's very interesting because even in lending, um, there are times where lenders will look back and they'll say, okay, what happened three years ago? What, why was there this blip? Like, what can you tell us about this? Tell us the story, right? <laughs> yeah. It's always about the story because you know what? As much as it seems scary, even when going through and getting a mortgage and having to go through all these questions, you have to understand, even if you're just getting a line of credit and you're just applying for say $5,000, somebody is still lending you $5,000. And in terms of like, and Phil will probably speak to this in more, a little bit more detail. We have to remember character is part of that overall credit worthiness. We wanna see that people aren't just gonna give you money and you're gonna go and blow it and be irresponsible with it. So somebody is trusting you to make those payments. And we want to make sure that even if something does come up, you have a plan to get out of it because if things happen in everybody's lives. There's no perfect year. Things happen and we understand that. But the story and what happened is so very important. Absolutely. It's it's it, just remember this, right, is is whatever you do nowadays gets reflected onto your, I guess, picture, overall picture and perspective that people and lenders and institutions will have of you. If your behavior is a negative one that doesn't fit the pattern that the participants in the market want to see, they're going to negatively affect you. It's just unfortunate. And, and so we have to, at a certain point, try to ensure that we're following those rules so that we always are eligible to, to, to be able to access credit. Um, Ali, you said in the beginning when you were talking about why this is important, why it's important to know how credit is created, just remind yourselves that Anybody that has access to credit compared to somebody that doesn't have access to credit over a period of 40, 50, 60 years can grow their net worth by a thousand percent more than somebody that doesn't have access to credit. So that's why this is important. <laughs> yeah. And again, it, it, it affects so many things. Like I said, even if you're just trying to get a student loan, like how likely do you think they are to extend another student loan to you to go back to school if you didn't even pay the first one back? 
and you've and you've got a job in your field and you met all that criteria and you and you got there but if you're not paying that loan so say you're an architect and you go well I'm not going to pay it back you want to go back and get your masters they're going to say buddy we gave you the opportunity and you didn't even pay us back we're not going to extend you money to go back and further that education because you didn't treat us so well the first time yeah okay so uh, the next thing, too, is what the actual scoring range is. So how many people are familiar with like Credit Karma and those other free credit tracking apps? OK, so you have access to things like Credit Karma and other things where they'll give you a range of scores. So the highest score you can have is 900, which is excellent. I've only personally myself seen it twice and they've all been women in their seventies again, who have had the same credit cards for like their entire lives. Um, but there's, there's that range of scores. And we were kind of talking earlier about what's that threshold that lenders like to see. So like Phil said, it's gonna differ a little bit from lender to lender. Ideally, we wanna see you close to that 700 range because that's, that's kind of a comfortable number for most lenders, because it tells us that, you know, you're being responsible, but maybe something has happened and that's okay. Whether it's your carrying balances, whether it's just that you had, you know, a missed payment or two in the past, like it's things that can be managed, right? It's when we drop below that, that tells us we have a lot of work to do to get someone credit worthy. So for example, if you have a score of 350 out of 900, we're gonna look at that and say, we, we've got a lot of work to do. We gotta see what's happening here. Why is your score so low? What is it that we need to improve on? Is it utilization? Is it that five years ago you had a credit card and you had a dispute and didn't pay it because it wasn't your charge and it's still sitting there and it's just constantly bringing your score down? These are all things that can be worked on, but the longer you let it go, the harder it is to fix. And that's a very important piece of information because people think I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to deal with it. It's not going to impact me. It always does. It always does. The sooner you deal with it, the better. Agreed. <laughs> There's nothing worse than when you're trying to get something done and it's from like seven years ago and you can't even find that company. It's not even around anymore. And you're just like, oh my God, where are we going to go from here? So is 350 the low? Like, is that the bottom? <laughs> my card doesn't go all the way down to zero. Technically, it goes all the way down to like insufficient and reject. Oh, really? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think the lowest, I think the actual lowest number is 300 possibly. Um, I can't say that I've seen one in 300, but I have seen 400s for sure, personally. Um, and there's a number of reasons that you might see something that's insufficient or rejected. So you might see a beacon reject um, because somebody has never had any credit in their name. So that's where insufficient and reject come in because it's just, we just don't have any data on this person. We know they have a SIN number. We know their date of birth and their name and their address, but we don't have any credit reporting at all. Right. So I know that when I was younger, I was looking for um, some a loan and they said, listen, we you're too new. We don't have any information on you. So that's when I was like, oh, okay, well, what is this whole credit thing? Um, but it was kind of interesting to hear because you could get a student loan, but you couldn't actually get anything, you know, outside of that because you're just too new, like you're whatever, 17 or whatever, and they just don't know anything about you. That was before cell phones and all that stuff when you had them at like 12. So <laughs> I couldn't start that. No, and 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 it's hard too, because I, I always like even when clients come in and they say, you know, my, my kid's turning 18, like how do I help them start building their credit? And honestly, sometimes the best place to start is your financial institution because they have, you know, if your kid is 18, has a job working at Tim Hortons, they have that payment coming in. And they can see that they're working and they're and they might be they might say, OK, we'll give your kid like a five hundred dollar credit card to start building their credit. And then over time, again, that limit can increase and they have the payment history so that uh, seven years later, when they're ready to go buy a house or apply for a car loan, they've had that card for seven years. 
and they've got the payment history for seven years. Because if that limit increases, it doesn't necessarily tell us where they started, but we're going to look at it seven years later and say, wow, this $5,000 card has no balance on it. And they've had it for seven years. That's great. Because again, that credit history is an important part of the overall of the overall scoring system too. But no, I was in the same boat trying to get my, my very first credit card. I was like, why is this so difficult? <laughs> like I bank here, can I just have a card please? Uh, <laughs> Phil, is there anything you want to add to that? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's important. It, it is important to start managing credit profile very early, as early as, as obviously legally it is possible. Um, I always, you know, I, I come from the banking system and it's one thing I've always said to parents when we were talking about financial um, awareness and understanding how, how you could manage your own future by managing credit properly. I was always talking to these parents, always saying, listen, talk to your kids, you know, when they reach the age of 18, bring them in, let's have a conversation, let's get them a credit product, let's, and not, the, my perspective was not, okay, I'm selling financial products. My pr perspective was these are future clients that need to be educated now. And the more financial education we give them, the easier it is for them to, to survive and grow and, and, and grow their assets over time. I, I do have a question. Um, and it's really, I think, kind of important for people to consider that uh, uh, there are folks that think that they can, um, they can go through life, you know, uh, without ever having credit whatever having to borrow uh, and then they reach a point where they have no credit <laughs> and they have to go through that process so um, do you think uh uh philip in your opinion uh, if somebody can actually uh, go through life without ever borrowing money from somebody else um that is a fantastic question and and so in the universe of people i would say there's probably there probably could be some people that would do that uh, depending on life expectations, depending on money they've received from family, or depending on inheritances, depending on whatever it is that, that 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 people have access to, I will say this: is it's actually the people that have higher financial positions that actually get more credit <laughs> than the people that don't, right? So, so I guess that kind of answers itself, right? There is an advantage to taking credit and to growing your assets uh, if you do it responsibly and properly. Uh, I would say in today's world with the way things have speculated in terms of prices, the way asset values are expensive, more expensive than they were uh, versus face income, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I would say it'd be very difficult for somebody uh, from a mid to low high class type of society to be able to go fully in life without having uh, any credit. Now, again, I am, of course, not considering people that have just very, you know, low expectations of what assets they want to own. And I guess they can go through to life without having a piece of credit, right? It's a, that's a choice, right? But I would say for anybody that wants to grow assets, for anybody that wants to take advantage of, of leveraging to be able to grow their potential value over time, credit is an essential tool. Okay. All right. And th the last question I have is, uh, can you just share with us, both you and, um, and um, uh, Alessandra, how we can reach you? Good. So, so I'll let, I'll let Ali respond to that one on uh, maybe half, uh, uh, as we are not directly consumer driven, we are broker driven. So our operation, uh, uh deals with, uh, 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 our customers are, are Alessandra. So, Wonderful. so basically, so basically we're on the backside of it. So we won't deal directly with the consumer. So Ali, if you want to go ahead and maybe even explain what I just said. <laughs> yeah. So what happens is when you work with a mortgage professional like myself or like Shannon, we have access to many different lenders. So when you think of mortgages, you think of the big banks, you think TD, RBC, Scotiabank, CIBC, those kind of things. However, they can only offer you one product, which is theirs. So when you work with someone like me and Shannon, what happens is we have so many more lenders that you will never, ever hear about until we put you with a mortgage with them. There's a lot of lenders who don't work always directly with the public, but they offer mortgages to mortgage professionals that we can provide to the clients. So if you want, so I would work with Phil to make sure that your situation fits with, with their guidelines. So we take everything into account and we say, okay, based on your overall profile and your application, this is probably the best way for you to go. Okay, so that's a good point there. I know that Shannon is also a part of this great city. So if you can both maybe just tell us uh, how how to be, how to reach you, the name of the company that you're with, and how people can reach out to you. 
Yeah, so again, Alessandra, I'm with RMA Mortgages. I can be reached by phone at 905-524-2832 or um, easiest way would be by email, which is always available on this great city. Um, but I can also reach out to anybody who would like to talk more in detail. Excellent, okay, great. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Shannon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shannon Green, and I am with Green Lending Corporation. And you can reach me at 905-598-6630. That's my direct number. Or you can send me an email at shannon at greenlending.ca. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll, I'll just say this. I, I remember the, the conversation I had with, um, with Alessandra and how you know, the things that I thought I knew, you know, I <laughs> I was really educated and I really appreciated it. And I encourage anybody, you know, this has been very informative, but anybody who has a question that wants to learn more about their specific situation or or whatever, I would reach out to Alessandra or, or, or Shannon. I would definitely reach out and just ask the questions because uh, they are very, very um, knowledgeable in this. You know, credit's a murky thing. So definitely uh, uh, get clarity. All right. That's, uh, that's my uh, two cents worth. But I, I want to thank you guys uh, for coming today. This is being recorded and it's on YouTube. So if anybody's missed anything, please check it out on YouTube uh, and, uh, you know, and get the information and, of course, reach out to Alessandra. Yes, perfect. Work, Alessandra. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, again, thanks everybody for coming again. So since today was a very generic, like learn how credit works and how it impacts your life, that sort of thing. Um, if you have specific questions to your personal concerns, like maybe you have, you think, okay, now, now that I know what's happening and I have, I know I have this, how can I go about that? Reach out to me, please, because it's a, it, it's a free consultation. It's not going to cost you anything, but it's very important to know what your next steps are because you can't improve something if you don't start making those steps. And depending what it is, it can take a very long time. So for example, if you have someone else's card reporting on your report, it takes a long time to sort out. It has happened. There is still human error that happens in these reporting policies. And again, like I said before, it has to go from the card company to Equifax, and then they have their own investigation that they have to do into it. You are better off to start it as soon as you know. And again, don't be shy get your free report every single year, make sure there's no fraud, make sure there's no mistakes. That is very, very important. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, well, thank you both very, very much. Did anybody have any final questions before we wrap up?